Hello and welcome to our Bible study, Longing, Waiting, Believing, by the Reverend Rodney Holder, for the 16th of December. And in today's study, Rodney speaks about his his own experiences in the Holy Land. And um, I'll mention also that I was there in July 2007, 13 years ago, gosh. Um, but the memories of the place, its history, and putting... Jesus in different locations was really helpful for me and it's had a lasting change in my sort of understanding of the Bible. So, 16th of December, pointing to the Saviour. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptising. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptising with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, for the one who sent me to baptise with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptises with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples and as he watched Jesus walk by he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. John chapter 1 verses 28 to 36. So for Reverend Rodney Holder, as a scientist, he says, I am always interested in how we can place the biblical narrative in its geographical and historical setting. Of course, we recognise that the scripture contains many kinds of literature and not all of it is meant to be read literally and historically. Most scholars would argue that the Gospel of John was written towards the very end of the first century and contains reflection of the church on the person of Christ. It is therefore less concerned with the historical detail than the other three so-called synoptic gospels. This may well be broadly correct, yet it's interesting that John gives certain geographical and historical indications which are not present in the other gospels. One here is the reference to Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptising. The Reverend Holder and his wife in 2013 led a pilgrimage tour to Jordan and on one of the visits was the site most probably to be identified with Bethany across the Jordan. The site was deemed important to the early church since their remains of three Byzantine ch chapels are still there and they were built to commemorate John's baptising of Jesus. Interestingly, it's also near the place where Elijah is said to have been carried into the heaven in a whirlwind. As we saw yesterday, John is the new Elijah. He is proclaimed as such by Jesus himself in Matthew 11:14. Even though in the verses preceding today's passage, the baptism itself refuses to accept this identification. It was a deeply moving experience to be in the place of pilgrimage. And they saw a group of Orthodox Christians on the Israeli side of the river undergoing full immersion baptisms. His group held a communion service during which they reviewed their baptismal bounds vows and dipping their fingers into the Jordan water, they signed each other with the cross. Of course, in one sense, it doesn't really matter precisely where John was baptising or if Jesus was baptised on that particular spot. The weekly Eucharist in church at home is as valid as any other. At the same time, there is something very special about being on a pilgrimage to holy sites with fellow Christians and celebrating the founding events of the faith in situ. I know that the... Uh, Church of the Nativity and kneeling at the point where there is a silver star marking where Jesus was lay. Um, it's just amazing. It's just a, a, a place set aside and I found it so special. And his group gelled together and I must admit my group gelled together as well. It was wonderful. The reading on the 2nd of December, um, the Reverend was in 2002 a chaplain of the English church in Heidelberg in Germany. Um, and uh, they made memorable trips from Heidelberg to the town of Colmar, just over the French border in Alsace. 
The Musée Unterlinden in Colmar contains a famous painting known as an Isenheim altarpiece. Paintings by Matthias Grunewald between 1512 and 1516. It depicts, unusually for its time, a harrowing, twisted and bloody picture of Christ on the cross. His body is covered in sores. The painting was displayed by the monks to patients suffering from St Anthony's fire, a terrible disease that racked the body in the way Christ's body was racked in the painting. The sufferers would have seen it every day when they came into the chapel for services. It's a picture of Christ truly entering into our own human sufferings and thereby bringing redemption. It depicts Christ directly fulfilling the prophecy we looked at last week. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Isaiah 53 verse 4. The point today, however, is to note that to the right of the picture we see John the Baptist with an exaggerated, elongated index finger pointing to the tortured figure of Christ. Written behind John in Latin are the words, He must increase, but I must decrease. The great Swiss theologian Karl Barth kept a reproduction of this painting hung above his desk for 50 years of his work as a pastor and theologian. Particularly important to him was the portrayal of John the Baptist and his pointing finger, which provided a suitable reminder of the task of the theologian. Like John, a theologian must point away from himself to Christ. Of course, in pointing to Christ, John is a model for all Christians, whether professional theologians or not. In today's passage, John points to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The imagery being brings to mind the whole system of animal sacrifice, which the writer to the Hebrews tells us was ultimately of no avail. In contrast, the one supreme sacrifice of Christ is effective in expiating the long catalogue of human misdeeds. How can we possibly thank God enough when we recognise that this is what it took? And how can we fail to point our friends and neighbours to this extraordinary gift to us of God's own Son? As we go deeper into Christ in our own spiritual journeys this Advent, let us remember the fact that, as William Temple put it, the Church is the only society on earth that exists for the benefit of non-members. And let us invite our friends to share the joy we have. Let's make our non-members members. And so for reflection, I will put a link to the Eisenheim altarpiece in the notes that accompany the YouTube video. It's in the description. And you'll be able to click on that and have a look. And as you look at the picture, say, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase, but I must decrease. And think of ways that you can point to the people, Jesus.